Okay, what you're about to see is roughly the last billion years of impact cratering events larger than 10 kilometers on the moon. This comes from a paper that is being published right now as of the launch of this video. And uh, after you watch, uh, then we'll talk about how they were able to figure out the ages of all of these craters and what it means for the Earth and its history. I thought that was a really cool animation and I wanted to share it with you. But how did they work out the ages of those craters? This is Professor David Page. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> so when lunar impact craters form and are fresh, they throw out all these rocks onto the surface. How big are these rocks? Well, the rocks we can identify with Diviner are at least one meter in diameter, but you might have seen pictures from Apollo where there's house-sized boulders that are thrown up in these impacts. So these impacts are like a really big, you know, big violent event. Now you'd expect that with no atmosphere or weathering like there is on Earth, those boulders would just sit there for the rest of time. But they don't. There are processes that break the boulders apart over millions of years. Notably, impacts from little meteors which reach these boulders, of course, because there is no atmosphere to burn them up. Plus, the thermal cycling from the very hot days and very cold nights. So over time, those large rocks crumble, and eventually, after a billion years or so, you can't distinguish them from the background dust and dirt. What we've done is characterize exactly how the boulders disappear over time, and then use that as a method of precisely dating the date of the impact. The more big, intact boulders that exist, well, the younger it is. If there's only a few crumbled boulders, it's probably pretty old. So this method of estimating the ages of craters only works for those craters a billion years old or younger. But on a dusty, rocky lunar surface, how did they detect these large boulders? Well, they used data from an orbiting spacecraft called the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, or LRO. On board, there is an instrument called the Viner, which is essentially an infrared camera. Now, during the lunar day, the surface of the moon gets really hot, absorbing all that sunlight. And remember, a day on the moon lasts two weeks. So those boulders gain a lot of thermal energy. And then, as lunar night settles in, the dusty surface cools down much faster than the rocks. You know, after the sun goes down, felt the pavement or something like that, and notice it was still warm, or, you know, put your uh, back up against a brick wall and say, oh, it's still warm here because it was warm by the sun. The same effect persists on the moon. And from orbit, we can detect uh, the difference in temperature of these big rocks. And so we have basically a big rock detector. So what did they find? Well, they discovered that the cratering rate on the moon was pretty steady for much of the last billion years. But then, about 300 million years ago, there was a sudden increase in the rate of impacts that has continued to the present. In fact, the rate of impacts increased by about 2.6 times over the previous period. In the world of science, you know, if something more than doubles, that's, that's a pretty big deal. What's great about studying the craters on the moon is it gives us insight into the geological history of Earth. I mean, on the scale of the solar system, the Earth and the Moon are pretty close together, so whatever conditions the Moon was experiencing, the Earth likely was too. But due to all the active processes on the Earth, like plate tectonics, weathering, biological activity, and so on, a lot of the craters that formed on the Earth have since been erased. You can see on this map here, by the way, on, on figure four, the relative sizes of the major impacts that have occurred during this period. And right there is the KT event. This is what wiped out the dinosaurs. But look at all these other ones that have been identified. These, though, are only a small fraction of the actual number of impacts that occurred, because these are only in places where the geology of the Earth has been stable enough that they haven't been erased. Okay? There were probably many, many more that maybe hit the oceans or other places where subsequent geologic events have erased these impacts. And so it shows how sort of important over the history 
on the geologic history of the Earth, the impacts actually have been. If you see a period of decreased cratering act activity in Earth's geological record, you have to ask whether it was due to an actual reduction in impacts or an increase in the rate of erosion. It's pretty hard to tell the difference. But the Moon is a reliable witness to the conditions that the Earth and Moon experienced. Now, in this case, the observations from the Moon corroborate evidence on Earth that suggests an increase in cratering rates in the last 300 million years or so. This may have had significant impacts for life on Earth. I mean, you could argue that this is possibly the most important thing that's ever happened to the Earth, all right? Uh, if you think what's, about, what's the most important thing? Well, that life somehow emerged and became intelligent. And, you know, this is due to the effects of evolution. And, you know, we don't really know what the ancient Earth really looked like, but uh, certainly the fact that the, this paper demonstrates that the flux of impactors went up something like 300 million years ago is like very significant because it means it put, you know, geologic pressure or environmental pressure on the environment. And this could have been a big factor in terms of how evolution decided like it needed to crawl onto the land, it needed to, you know, uh, develop legs, it needed to, uh, you know, develop different types of plants and ultimately, you know, uh, develop into humans like us. So it's, it's, it's a big deal that, that, that we can detect this in the geologic record of both the Moon and the Earth. So I imagine a lot of you are wondering, is Sciencium happening again? To be honest, I don't know. Uh, this is kind of an experiment. I'm throwing it out there to see what happens when you don't post anything on a channel for like two years and does it still work? I can't believe it's been that long, but there you go. Uh, anyway, uh, let me know if you like this video, if you don't like it, if you think it's a good idea to post over here or whether you want all of this sort of stuff um, on the main channel. But obviously I want a, a, an outlet where I can post things that are, you know, like new science discoveries and hopefully time them with those discoveries because um, I think that, that could be kind of useful. But let me know what you think in the comments below. I'll be in there uh, responding to you. So um, anyway, thanks for watching.